Let's go over the muscles and how this information is connected to training, the health related components, and other information that you'll use anytime that you go and work out. So I want to cover the major muscle groups that are hit when you do resistance training. So this is the anterior view of a person. So this first one I'm pointing at is a deltoid. The deltoid is broken into three major parts. This is the anterior portion of the deltoid. So anytime you do bench press or push-ups, you're training the, the anterior portion of the deltoid. The middle portion of the deltoid is used in abduction. So if I have a center line that cuts this person in half, and I take the arm away from that center line, that's abduction. If I bring it back towards the center line, that's adduction. So you're abducting the arm away, or you're adding it back. It's a good way to remember it. That'll train the middle portion of the deltoid. And if you do any kind of pulling action, like rows or lat pull down, then you'd hit the posterior deltoid, which we'll look at in just a second. Here's a bicep. Anytime you do arm curls or pull-ups, you'll hit the biceps. This is rectus abdominis. So anytime you do sit-ups, you hit the rectus abdominis. And here's pectoralis major. Again, it's a pushing muscle, so bench press, push-ups if you're using body weight. This is the quadriceps. It's four muscle groups in one. So squats or lunges, and I think I've given you five there. Let's flip over to the other side. Oh, one thing I want to note is the traps or trapezius, one of the few muscles you can see from anterior and posterior view. Here we can just barely see the traps, unless they're a bodybuilder, then they'd be huge. Flip this over. The traps, trapezius, make a diamond shape back here. So they go from base of the neck down between the shoulder blades and they're a superficial muscle you can see them underneath the skin we'll talk about that in just a second as well so shrugs um, you'll see like if you ever go to a shoulder press machine and it says that you're using the trapezius it's because at the end of that lift when you lift that weight up over your head you got to shrug your shoulders up and that's how the trapezius are being hit here we have triceps triceps take up two-thirds of your arm so if you're trying to increase the size of your arm you really need to focus on your triceps and then you have latissimus dorsi it's a pulling muscle as well so triceps are a pushing muscle so push-ups bench press the trapezius or latissimus dorsi are a pulling muscle most of your major muscle groups in the back are going to be pulling. Remember I talked about posterior deltoid? That's a pulling muscle. Trapezius are also a pulling muscle to some extent. Rhomboids, which are a deeper muscle that you can't see, are a pulling muscle. Teres major, teres minor, also a pulling muscle. So most of your back muscles are pulling. And then you have the hamstrings here does the curling action for the leg. So just like the biceps did the curling action for the upper body or for the arm, uh, the hamstring or biceps femoris does the curling action for the leg. Here we have gastrocinemus, which is your calf muscle. So if you did squats or lunges, you're hitting both of those. So I think I've given you five here. Oh no, we need one more. Oh, no, I think I've given you five, but I'll give you one more. Gluteus maximus. So squats, lunges, all of those will hit the gluteus maximus. So anterior versus posterior. I talked about the deltoid. You can have it do pushing if it's anterior, pulling if it's posterior, abduction, adduction. We're talking about the middle portion of the deltoid. We talked about the trapezius, mainly a pulling muscle. But anytime you do shrugs, you're going to hit the trapezius. Superficial versus deep. Superficial are the muscles that you can see right underneath the skin. So all the ones that I listed, minus the rhomboids, are superficial. A good example of a deep muscle would be the rhomboids. So it's underneath the trapezius. You can't see it. It goes through the shoulder blades. 
helps you pinch those shoulder blades together. That's a deep muscle. Different actions. You have a concentric contraction here, so we're looking at an arm. And you have the biceps doing a curling action, so it's lifting the weight. That's a concentric contraction. But here we have the bicep lowering the weight. That's an eccentric. It's elongating. Think eccentric, elongating. Think concentric, think contracting. That'll help you remember it. So I talked about the guy with the center line. Let's say we cut him in half here. If the arm goes away from that point, that's abduction. You abduct the arm. If you bring it back to the body, you add it back to the body, that's adduction, which is over here. Types of muscle exercises. So isotonic would be like bench press, push-ups. We're going through the range of motion. We're causing the muscles to contract. It's dynamic. We can speed up or slow down the contraction. There's no change in speed there. Isometric, we're just holding a static position. So if you've ever seen a person do plank, that's isometric. You see that in some sports. You see it in gymnastics where they'll get to a position and hold it or even in wrestling where they may get into a clinch and hold that clinched position. Now their legs may be moving around, but for some of the muscles, they're isometric. The legs that are moving are isotonic. Isokinetic. So there are isokinetic machines that you can get on and the muscle will still contract, will still concentrically contract, but the rate is maintained. It's a constant rate. It doesn't change. You can't go any faster. It's a consistent contraction rate. So that's really the main difference. It's still dynamic. You're still going through a range of motion, but the rate is constant. Anatomy of a muscle. So break it down to its smallest level at the myofibrils. Then you take connective tissue that binds all those myofibrils together into a muscle fiber bundle. Then you take perimosome, connect all those muscle fibers together, and then we have that muscle fiber bundle that makes up the muscle. So you have epimosome connecting all of that together. Then you have tendinous attachments that attach the muscle to the bone. So the idea here is this White stuff is connective tissue, most of it's collagen. Some of it, especially the parts that are in this perimosum, are collagen. Well, even on the epimosum, you have collagen within it. The collagen allows the muscle to elongate, and the collagen is the structure, holds everything together. So if you've ever cut yourself really deep and you saw those little white squiggly pieces of flesh in the muscle, that's collagen. So think of elastin, it's kind of like elastic in your waistband. It allows your waistband to stretch out and then go back to its normal shape. That's what elastin does for the muscles. So when we stretch out the muscle, it'll recoil back to its normal shape. Muscle hypertrophy, so muscle growth. This is what we're looking for when we do weight training or resistance training. We're looking for muscle hypertrophy. We want to increase the amount of lean mass. So we're breaking down. We get these little micro tears in the myofibrils and the muscle fibers. As they heal back, that causes growth. Structure increases. Muscle memory and retention of what you do. So don't get bogged down. This is a complex diagram, but what we're talking about here is you start off training, you get the mus muscle hypertrophy from that, then maybe you stop training, but it's really easy. Your muscles are going to remember those actions. So when you start training again, you'll get that muscle growth, and it'll happen sooner. It doesn't take you a lot of time to get back to your normal training level. Delayed onset muscle soreness. So anybody that's ever worked out, even if it wasn't a structured workout, and you did something that you weren't accustomed to and you got sore from it, that's what we're talking about. Normally the second day is typically the worst. So what happens is you get this little micro trauma in the muscle and they rupture and then they have to heal. And as they heal, that's where the soreness come from. Used to, we thought it was because of lactic acid. The muscles were exposed to lactic acid, 
That's what causes soreness. That's not true. It's the microtrauma that occurs. So here's a, a better picture of it. These little myofibrils that make up the muscle fiber get these little tears and ruptures in them. And as those heal, growth starts to occur and, and the muscle fiber itself will start to get thicker and thicker and thicker. So now let's get into muscle fiber type. And a chicken is a great example of the two main classifications of muscle fibers. Now there are more than that, but a chicken really brings it home because you can see it in the same animal. And we're talking about farm-raised chicken, not one stuck in a cage. So a chicken can run around all day long. And if you've ever had the drumstick from a farm-raised chicken, it's all dark meat. It has a lot of myoglobin in it, a lot of blood supply, a lot of capillary innervation. It has a lot of blood supply to it because we need oxygen to get to those cells so that chicken won't get tired of running around. That's slow twitch muscle fibers. And then a chicken can't fly very far. And if you've seen a chicken breast, it's almost all white meat. That's fast twitch. It's, more specifically, it's fast twitch glycolytic muscle fiber. So they can't fly very far. They fly for about 10 or 12 seconds, and then they get fatigued, and they have to land, mainly because they have these little short wings, but it's also the muscle fiber is not developed for long, sustained flight. Like if you look at a duck's breast, it's all dark meat. It needs to be fatigue-resistant. Fast twitch muscle is explosive, just a means of escape for a chicken. They're not going to fly very far, and then they're going to try to run away because now they have fatigue resistance in their legs. But they can use their wings to evade predators. But now here's a more complex explanation of muscle fiber types. You have slow twitch, which you would see more in like marathon runners. And some of this is genetic, like we are just predisposed but on average, the untrained person has about 50% slow twitch, 50% fast twitch, but it can change through training, and some people do better because of their genetics. Like they're more predisposed to certain events. You may have seen somebody that's more of a mesomorph. We'll get into that later. Where they have more muscle than an ectomorph. Somebody that's long and lean like me, you know. So, muscle fiber types, you have slow twitch. Those are type 1 fibers. Fatigue resistant, but not very explosive. Then you have two main types of fast twitch, and you also have intermediates between these. But let's just get to the, the two main types of fast twitch. You have fast twitch oxidative glyco glycolytic, which are type 2A, and those are more for muscle endurance. And you have fast twitch glycolytic, which are more explosive, more muscle strength. Kind of like the chicken, right? All white meat runs off the immediate source of ATP within it. We can see this in athletes. So sprinters have big, bulky muscles that are fast twitch, especially in their lower body. You can see how huge these muscle fibers are compared to a marathon runner. So somebody that runs marathons is going to have more slow twitch. Excess muscle is great for explosion, but it's not so good for t for fatigue resistance. It'll use up the available oxygen source that's out there. It just It doesn't run off that energy system. It can actually impair your performance on muscle endurance and cardiorespiratory endurance events. That's why we see the difference in these athletes and that's why they participate in those events. Here we can see it underneath the microscope. So slow twitch, here we have a long distance runner. Slow twitch, all dark fibers, a lot of blood supply to it, a lot of myoglobin, uh, more aerobic steady power this person has endurance fast twitch anaerobic explosive power like powerlifting and sprinting but it fatigues easy if you can memorize this this will help you out if you ever go into exercise physiology it connects the health related components to some major areas in exercise phys and this is really how you need to learn is connecting information. So here we have the health related component of muscle strength that's connected. If I want to improve muscle strength, I would focus on developing fast twitch glycolytic muscle. These are going to be good for events that last 10 to 12 seconds and I would run off the immediate source of ATP within the muscle. That's the reason I don't have to have a lot of blood supply to the muscle. 
I'm going to have a huge, large motor neuron, and these are going to be good for events like powerlifting and sprinting. If I want to focus on muscle endurance, I will develop more fast twitch oxidative glycolytic muscle. It's great for events that last one to three minutes. We're going to use glycoly glycolysis to generate our ATP. The motor neuron is going to be moderate in size, so we can get some rapid contraction, but not the same as with muscle strength activities. And we're going to have events like push-ups for one minute, lunges for one minute, anything around that one to three minute time frame is going to be perfect to develop those muscle fiber types. And then you have cardiorespiratory endurance, which is more conducive to developing slow twitch muscle. So anything that's great, continuous, repetitive, over five minutes, the main energy system that's going to be used is the aerobic oxidative energy system. These three systems are connected. They all work together depending on how fast you go and how long you're going to go for. Motor neuron size is small and it would be great for events like marathons or adventure racing or what have you. So if you're going to go out and do something like a Spartan race or a Tough Mudder, um, having a lot of muscle endurance and cardiorespiratory endurance, these two go hand in hand. But trying to develop muscle strength and elite level cardiorespiratory endurance not gonna happen they actually compete against each other you need to specialize if you're going into muscle strength alright genetics genetics plays a big role and we'll eventually get into different classifications like uh, body types so mesomorphs like Arnold ectomorphs like me long and lean built for the heat endomorphs Shorter, stockier, big, broad, barrel chest, built for the cold. Um, endomorphs are, are, are great in the cold because they keep the blood close to the core. Anyway, let's get to this picture real quick and what I was getting at. So, Arnold and I are the same height, but we have a different body type, different genetics. And I know he's taking steroids, but if Arnold and I started or let's say I start training, but Arnold doesn't touch any weights. I might get as big as Arnold. I might get a little bit bigger than Arnold. And I may have to supplement to get a little bit bigger than Arnold. But if Arnold ever touches a weight, I'll never be able to compete with him. He's got the genetics for it. He is built for bodybuilding. So genetics plays a big role in the sports that you choose. So... What you're going to do in the discussion for this section is you'll list the three main types of muscle fibers and describe the type of training you would do if you wanted to help improve or recruit those type of muscle fibers in yourself. So each one. So how would you develop slow twitch? What type of training would you do for it? How would you develop fast twitch glycolytic muscle strength activities? Um, how would you develop fast twitch oxidative glycolytic, which is more related to muscle endurance? Each one, discuss how you would develop your training to improve those areas.